Show off your robot to thousands on the front page of Twitch. Submit your robot reveal video to Fun Premiere Night by going to tinyurl.com forward slash fun 2019 info to learn more. So we're going to look at the robot side of things now. So luckily, this is the last time that we'll ever have to co cover this type of topic. Well, the last year, but let's quickly remind ourselves about unbag time for district teams. Um, how much do you get? When can you use it? What can you do and what can you not do? Um, and withholding allowance. I feel like these are things that always come into question, even with teams that are super duper veterans, um, because you never know what type of LRI you're going to run into at your first event. So we would love to know for district teams, how do you guys handle your withholding allowance? And what advice would you give to teams who aren't sure what to do or what the rules around it are? Um, maybe for teams who don't have a practice robot, what do you suggest teams do kind of with that unbagged time? I would say, it's, it's, again, it's all about the plan. Um, right now, you should have a really good idea with all the time that people have lost to weather. You should have an idea where you are, right? We you, Everybody thinks they're going to bag a fully functional robot. Most teams are not. We're probably not. And so you have to start looking, what's our what's our withholding going to be? We, we and, and you might have to start scaling back. Um, and we had this great idea for this two-sided ground floor or, you know, floor uh, hatch pickup. Maybe we just get you just at this point, you just have to go with a, a, a static first level hatch pickup. And then you use your withholding allowance. You know, so it's, again, I think it's all about the plan, uh, knowing where you are and, and planning where you're going to do with it. And, and, and all the rules, it's the most misunderstood thing. And I don't, I, I don't know if... <laughs> I give people uh, give them the benefit of the doubt that it's that it's honest mistakes. Um, you're not allowed to take, uh, you know, thir another 30 pounds every day that you unbag uh, that kind of stuff. It's one set of 30 pounds. Um, but most mechanisms, you know, our two main mechanisms to combine are less than 30 pounds, so you can fit a lot in 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Karthik, do you have any advice for teams that are like anxious or confused about? what to do with their withholding allowance or their unbagged time. Yeah, I mean, you know, and we keep talking about it, like, you know, we talked about the importance of practice and we talked about the importance of planning and that's what it comes down to. Like you just, you know, you've got to try and figure out all the things that you might be able to do in those six hours and which ones are the most important, which ones are going to lead you to the on-field success at your first event and focus on those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the withholding allowance, it's super important to start weighing things as you introduce them. So if you've opened the bag and you're introducing parts that were pre that were pre built, they are part of the withholding allowance. So you have to weigh them and you know cut that off your thirty pounds. And so you might you might end up using twenty pounds during your out of bag time, and then only have ten pounds you know when you come in. And realistically, I don't know how many inspectors check this in detail, but like FRC relies on the honor system. And it breaks down completely if you aren't doing this right. So I take it, you know, I think all teams should take it upon themselves to do this properly and, you know, have a little short spreadsheet, you know, that just kind of tracks, hey, we introduced this much during phase A, and we introduced this much during phase B. But, you know, you just have a plan. And like everything with building robots, don't try and commit to too much. Don't try and squeeze 10 hours of work into six hours of out of bag time. You've got to be reasonable with what you can get done and focus on doing that well, as opposed to just getting, because there's nothing worse than saying, okay, our robot's not done, but with six hours of out of bag time, we're going to get things finished. But then you like scramble and you try and add on functionality that doesn't need to be there. And then all of a sudden you still have a robot that's not done. It just has more stuff. So these are the things that you want to be careful about. Yeah, definitely. Um, so coach Norm, as you guys are kind of approaching this new kind of way of operating during a build or a competition season, um, what, what is your kind of like plan, I guess, moving forward with like unbag time rather than being at the event, like we talked about before, where you have, you know, the practice field and FMS and stuff. So for us, we have no access to a field here in town. Uh, so we don't even have a, a space on campus for us to set up. So losing the practice day is going to be critical for us because it's always been a, a big day. So our goal has been to, we, we always go week one because I like week one myself and I think I can play to my strengths as a coach to try to strategize maybe to gain an advantage for us. So our goal is Tuesday night to bag the robot that we feel we can compete with at the week one tournament. 
meaning that the out of bag time then is going to be focused on programming and drive uh, in terms of learning to manipulate and do things with that. So we're not going to have a lot of drive, a lot of drive time between now and next Tuesday. So that's our, our drive and focus is to get the contest robot to the position that we will compete with that at the tournament. And we also know it's not going to be, as, as both Tom and Karthik mentioned, it's not going to have all the functionality. And we don't think it has to have all the functionality for us to compete at a week one event like it would the Texas District Championship or, or Champs in Houston. Absolutely. Um, and so we had a lot of questions today in the Discord asking about how teams prep their pit area um, between you know how you decide what you bring how you're going to set it up and the people that are operating within that space. So um, a user asked, uh, how many people do teams normally keep in the pit at competition and how do they decide who is in the pits? Is there some sort of rotation or is it a set list? I'll start off. Uh, we have a sub team lead for each each sub uh, subsystem on our robot. We have a programming electronics and in each of the subsystems, and that person is is the go to first and foremost at the pit, and then they usually have their first assistant that has worked with them throughout the season, and uh, they'll take and rotate in and out there. Uh, we also have our outreach team there, and we we actually rotate our outreach team people. We try to have one of our presenters, one of our three presenters always in the pit, and then we try to have two other uh, non-presenters that would be there at the pit all the time with us. And then uh, we involve our safety captain as one of our workers on the robot as well. Awesome. Um, exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, how do you guys operate? I know you have a pretty big team. <laughs> yes, we're actually, we grew a lot this year. So we have about 60 kids on the team. And we definitely always have too many in the pit. It's a huge problem. So we actually have a set list. Um, and if you're not on the list um, and you're in the pit and it's getting overcrowded, the pit lead who, the pit mentor lead, not the pit lead, but the mentor in charge um, can ask you to leave the pit just because we have to keep that area fairly clear. Um, we have have all of the robot pit crew is there then we also have the drive team and then the final bit as norm said is the chairman's presenters and outreach and drudge crew so between that group it can get quite crowded um, especially when you add in a championship especially about 5,000 people trying to come to our pit to get little clippy koalas. Um, so <laughs> that becomes part of the whole pit management process for us as well, is trying to get people their koala. And, um, you know, we want to have a chat with as many people as we can, but also making sure that the students on the robot are able to shine and the students with the judges are able to shine. So it's definitely a balancing act in that pit space because it is so small. Mm -hmm. And sometimes at district events, they're super duper duper small. Um, so I'm always, one of my favorite things to do like at events, especially um, whether it's like a regional that we're traveling to or at champs is really walking around and checking out how people set up their pit displays. So on the neutrons, we're slowly evolving into a team that is able to uh, look like decently polished, at least from the very front of the pit. Um, but I'm always amazed by, you know, international teams that show up and they put together this really professional display or this like really high functioning kind of layout of their pit um, and teams that, you know, keep it really simple, but, you know, have a really well thought out display. Um, and then there's the teams that bring like the pop-up tents that have to like crouch it smaller because, you know, the district event only has a smaller pit as opposed to the larger one. So um, how, so I'm going to go back to Karthik on this one because I think um, 1114 is one of those teams that is very like clean and polished and straightforward with how they kind of have their pit very functional for their robot, but also very um, like professionally displayed to tell their team story. So what advice would you have for teams that are kind of starting from square one with figuring out, okay, where do like, where do we start with planning at our team's pit? Uh, I mean, like function over form uh, is the number one thing. I think that a lot of teams, they come into their first event and I think they're just getting bad advice. People are like, yo, you need to build a castle and you need to have this like elaborate structure and you need a tent and you need all these screens. And like, 
I see teams year after year, and they're spending like three hours on their first day putting up their stupid castle. And it's just like, how are you going to like, you, you need that time to work on your robot. So like, it's absolutely, it's, it's about function. And especially for a team without many resources, like, do you want to spend your time on your castle? Or do you want to spend your time on your robot? And so I'm saying just like, leave it simple, make sure you have lots of room, get your tools set up in an efficient way and get your parts set up in an efficient way where things are easy to find and people know them. One thing that 1114 um, has done a lot is we try and set up an area at our practice field that is exactly the way our pits are going to look. So people get used to finding parts in the same location. And so you kind of build a little bit of muscle memory there. But um, just don't don't overdo it and like have too much stuff going on. You want to really be functional. And that same goes for having too many people in the pit. It's, I mean, it's a 10 by 10 space or like an eight by eight space in some places. So you can't really overcrowd it. And it can't, pit can't become a, the pit can't become a storage area for like everyone's jackets or whatever. Like, I don't think you have this problem, Sarah, but like here, winter coats <laughs> take up a lot of space. <laughs> so, you know, like that, that stuff there. The and, struggle. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's so real, you know, and like, you know, um, when people want to eat lunch, like go eat lunch somewhere else, like just like let this area be functional. Absolutely. I love the point that you made of like setting up a mock pit. Um, it's something completely easy to do, even if you don't have a ton of space. Um, but it's it's really wise to like, like plan for worst case scenario with like the tiny, tiny pit where like you're basically getting encroached on from like all sides um yeah anybody oh go ahead you know i see like a lot of teams who like will have like a setup at their shop and then they'll move tools out of that setup into a specific like pit scenario and like i just think the teams that are the most functional are the ones who are like they just bring the same toolbox that they have in their shop right into the pit mm -hmm. and that way they know where everything is and because we all know you know when your robot when something happens to it in the elims and you've got a six minute timeout to figure stuff out you did like, every second counts. And if you're looking for a tap for like 30 seconds, like you're, you're toast. So just, you know, setting up your team to succeed by setting up your pit properly. We have two toolboxes also. So one has the, you know, three eighths and the seven sixteenths, the ones you normally use. And the other one has all those other sizes. So you're not digging through a whole drawer to find that one part uh, that you need, but you've got it on site if you, if you need it. One of the things that's really important for us is making sure we have all the metric tools because if we bring, you know, all of our Imperial ones, uh, normally we can borrow those at championship off someone, but if we don't have a metric tool, we're in trouble. I, I, I'm going to tell like a 30 second funny story, but the first time 1114, uh, we went to the Long Island Regional in 2004, and this is back when you had to ship your robots and whatever, and we, um, our, our tools were like locked in the toolbox and stuff one mentor forgot the keys so we didn't we couldn't get to our tools right away and we're like oh we'll just borrow like tools from another team to open our crate except we used um robertson screws which are like a oh. canadian screw head and so we like couldn't open our crate but luckily team 229 um and adrian emerson and chris carnival they had the robertson bits because they were right by the canadian border and that's how we became <laughs> friends with them so that's a <laughs> story that's amazing we need your help to keep fun loud live and independent Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.